Um, the other thing is that, that this kind of, a, of an approach ties up resources that we are short of, so MRI scans and so forth. So we really want to marshal these in a way where we're learning from it, and then if it pans out, then it will become commonplace. And having been uh, active in treating MS patients for the last 25 years, I've lived through a few um, false leads before. I, I can't say any of them have been quite as striking as the numbers of, of Zamboni's hypothesis, and I, I, I surely hope that this doesn't turn out to be a false lead. But I can, you can understand why that would happen. MS is a very unpredictable disease. There are ups and downs, and sometimes people get better for reasons we just don't understand. There's also a very strong thing in, in any human condition, the so-called placebo response. And uh, things that came out with a lot of fanfare in the last few years, particularly on the internet, uh, you may remember the um, Procarin patches. You may remember something called low-dose naltrexone, or LDN. When they were actually studied more properly, there's perhaps a modest effect on a few symptoms, but they didn't really affect the underlying disease. So, uh, again, my point is just that we need to study it properly. Um, the excitement about this one is that it's not just an observation about, the, about blood vessels, though. It lends itself to a potential treatment. And if we can corroborate the initial studies, uh, then we would like to go on and uh, see where we go. But first of all, prove that there is a problem with the veins. Thanks very much. Um, well, first of all, I want to thank the organizers uh, for all their efforts in planning this, uh, this event today. It's really great, um, a great opportunity, certainly for us at McMaster and the Faculty of Engineering, uh, to be a part of this uh, important team along with uh, Ian Rogers and all his colleagues at uh, St. Joseph's Hospital and, and Foundation. Um, the, uh, the McMaster School for Biomedical Engineering was created a number of years ago by both the faculties of engineering and health sciences at McMaster. It was something that brought together uh, bioengineering related activities and really enabled us to move into emerging areas of biomolecular, biomedical and bioengineering uh, research where uh, advances in clinical practice are really dependent on the development of new technologies. So our work in the school involves biomaterials and interfaces where we are working, for example, on the development of artificial cornea, biomechanics for new implants, biophotonics applied to pathogen detection, uh, biorobotics and the development of robot surgery, or robotic surgery, um, and of course the area of interest today, which is medical imaging. Uh, and our school offers uh, master's and PhD degrees in all of these areas, and many of these students have supervisors who come from both the faculties of engineering and, and health sciences. So it's really a, um, a, unique, a unique endeavor. And about five years ago, as part of the school's development, we recruited one of the top medical imaging experts in the world, Dr. Mark Hakey, to help us establish a medical imaging focus at the university. Mark is currently the director of the imaging division of the School for Biomedical Engineering and is also an adjunct professor in the Department of Electrical and Computer Engineering. He's also associated with the Brain Body Institute at St. Joseph's Healthcare in Hamilton. Mark is a native of Canada and also holds citizenship in the United States. He is the director of the MRI Institute for Biomedical Research and the director of the MR Research Facility um, at Wayne State University. His focus is on the development of MRI techniques for research into human brain and conditions such as multiple sclerosis, stroke, trauma, tumor identification, and Alzheimer's disease. Dr. Hakey earned all of his degrees from the undergraduate level to his PhD in physics at the University of Toronto. He then moved south in 1978 to pursue research in theoretical high energy physics at Case Western Reserve University. He later joined the radiology department at Case and remains associated with that university as an adjunct professor. In 1993, he accepted a position with Washington University as a professor of radiology. He has collaborative arrangements with Loma Linda University in California and is an adjunct professor in radiology there. In 2004, in Kyoto, Japan, Dr. Heike was awarded the gold medal of the International Society for Medical Residence uh, Imaging in Medicine for his, in, for his innovative uh, contributions to magnetic resonance imaging. Dr. Hickey has independently pioneered the study of veins and iron and multiple sclerosis alongside Dr. Zamboni and has brought medical research or, or, or MR imaging to bear on this important uh, breakthrough in multiple sclerosis. 
Through this joint CCVS, CCSVI MS research project, we're looking forward to building a strong partnership between McMaster University and St. Joseph's Hospital. This will actually be the first collaborative research effort on this scale involving the Faculty of Engineering at McMaster and any of the research hospitals in Hamilton. So we see this as a major breakthrough on a number of different fronts. Dr. Hakey's expertise provide, provides a vital component to the overall scope of the project. He also will act as a primary liaison to establish a strong trans translational cl clinical research relationship between the hospital and the university. Please welcome Dr. Mark Hakey. Thank you very much, David, and I guess formally I would say Madam Chairman and Mr. Chairman, and ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure for me to be here today back in my home territory. I have family here still in Toronto and I always enjoy coming back here to Toronto. Um, imaging is really an amazing advance today. Uh, and imaging was, I think, voted in um, one of the major journals, Nature, a few years ago as one of the top 10 most important discoveries in the last thousand years. And the reason for this is that we can image your body non-invasively today. We don't need to cut you open as in the famous picture of Rembrandt called Dr. Tulp's Anatomy. So this gives us tremendous opportunity to investigate our body on a regular basis and see if there's something wrong. And of course, if we have something wrong, like multiple sclerosis, then we have a chance to go in and see what is wrong or what the level of that disease is. So um, I would add a little bit to what Dr. Paulza said a few minutes ago that it, it's, depending on where you are, it seems that women are, are somewhere between two and three times more likely than men to have this disease. I'm not sure we know why. The symptoms can be mild and you can uh, go for decades without uh, suffering seriously or they can be debilitating very quickly, again, as Dr. Paulza said. You can have vision problems, loss of balance, extreme fatigue, speech or memory failure, muscle stiffness and paralysis. And a lot of these functions are controlled by the brain. So if something goes wrong in the brain, then you're going to have problems. So I have an image here to, just to show you that using MR today, we can actually see examples of these lesions in the brain. And these bright areas are examples of white matter lesions that tend to be markers for multiple sclerosis today. So the physician will see an MS patient, he'll have some hints that these symptoms the patient has might be multiple sclerosis, but one of the verifying facts is being able to do something like MRI to show that. In Canada, there are somewhere between 55 and 75,000 MS patients, and that's a lot of people with the disease, roughly 1,000 new cases every year, and a tremendous economic impact of about $1 billion a year annually. So the real question is, the chicken or the egg? There has been evidence for more than 100 years that there's venous involvement in multiple sclerosis. However, it's kind of come and gone. Every 10 or 20 years, somebody comes along with new evidence that the veins may play a role. But then along comes some very interesting information on the general biochemistry of the brain and how it's working and fits in with the autoimmune concept. So there, there is important information on both sides. But one of the more interesting studies was done by Tracy Putnam in 1935, where he did a dog model, and he purposely blocked the small veins in the brain. And he found that, in fact, these obstructions led to sclerotic lesions very similar to what we see in humans. Then for the next 75 years, the, the focus really was on the inflammatory demyelinating aspects of the disease, although here and there several people brought back the concept that veins were important. <clears throat> 